cannabis, the most widely used illegal drug in the world. This is not 60s marijuana anymore. This is very potent stuff now. In the UK, this stronger strain is called skunk. And it's being grown here on an industrial scale. The Cleveland Police had never come across anything like this before. It was a massive factory for growing cannabis. These illegal farms are big business for organized crime. There is huge amount of profit for the people behind this trade. It's also a global problem. The illegal cultivation of marijuana on public lands uh, in California is what I would call in a crisis mode. Millions of cannabis users worldwide campaign for its legalization. This is the largest global marijuana march in the world today with 250 cities. I'm flattered to be thought of so highly by the US Justice Department as a villain. Some believe it has medicinal benefits. My objective here is to show people other alternatives for pain relief. Others have seen it ruin lives. He was throwing things, he was aggressive. The psychiatrist said it was most certainly that the cannabis had brought on the psychosis. Pot, weed, marijuana, skunk. Cannabis goes by many names. It's been called the devil's harvest, the assassin of youth. Today, it is stronger than ever. It is just as controversial, and the recent boom in large-scale illegal indoor farming means it could be growing in a street near you. Between April 2007 to March 2008, police raided over 3,000 cannabis farms across the UK. From the outside, they look like normal suburban homes. Inside, they've been converted by organized gangs into specialist hothouses, designed to grow the most potent strain of cannabis there is, skunk. I would estimate that whatever the police are seizing, if it's um, 60 million pounds worth, it's probably 600 million pounds worth or even a billion pounds worth that is in circulation. Criminals and criminal gangs and organized crime has always looked for areas in which they can make a profit and that they can make a high profit. You know, from their point of view, here is the most widely used drug in this country. There's a great deal of bulk involved. If we can cut out the middleman, if we can produce it ourselves, then we're looking at huge profits. This is not a few people growing cannabis in their back bedroom for personal use. These are gangs who have perfected a massive money-making operation. What we've found is that we have someone at the head of the organization, usually the person that's willing to put up the, the cash to initially start off um, the number of premises. And we'd always see this group come into an area and be looking for anything between three and maybe 10 premises. They would then bring in sort of the installation engineers, the people that would install the electrics, set the premises up. Now then we've got the lowest of the low basically, these are people that have been exploited. Um, we found a lot of Vietnamese people come in and being employed as farmers. So quite a sophisticated business that had been set up with each person having a certain part to play in the organisation. With cannabis farming at unprecedented levels, the police are using every means possible to tackle them from intelligence on the ground to cutting-edge technology in the air. The lighting and insulation of the cannabis farms generates huge amounts of heat that must be ventilated, usually into the loft or roof space. Police helicopters equipped with state-of-the-art heat-seeking cameras fly over any suspected properties. The heat is picked out as black on white or white on black. Here you can clearly see the roof of one house, white against the surrounding grey and black buildings. The camera is switched to black on white, giving an even clearer result. Images like these were instrumental in helping Cleveland police bring down one of Britain's largest cannabis farm networks, run by organised crime. We knew that these premises inside um, should have been unoccupied. We know there was no heating on them, um, but they were showing up this large amount of heat from different parts of the building, from the skylights, from the corners of the building, and from certain parts of the windows as well. But even this did not prepare the Cleveland police team for what they would find inside. 
When we came down, we had to enter the premises from three different locations, and one of the areas that we entered was, was this door here, uh, where we sent a number of officers in. It was a massive, massive factory for growing cannabis. Numerous cannabis plants, ducting, lighting. Within the premises, there was some 80 rooms. Each one of those rooms was either being used in the process of being developed for usage or had been used for the cultivation of cannabis. Another room, dealing with a different stage of cultivation. We found large areas of ducting uh, running through the building to take um, the air and the, from the different rooms. We also found large scale uh, industrial lighting units. So, hello, 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 do you understand English? Also inside we found three Chinese males who were working on the cultivation and growing of the, the cannabis inside. The team seized over 4,000 plants. The estimated street value of this hall was one million pounds. But the factory had already produced much more. And there was certainly evidence that we had and were able to find at a later date to say that at least one, if not two, further crops had been grown in these premises. This factory led the police to many more. In total, they raided 23 houses, seized 10,000 plants, broke up six organized crime gangs, and made 28 arrests. The Cleveland Police had never come across anything like this before, and I think also, as we started to make the inquiries, no one in the North East had, had come across uh, such a large-scale production area. It was organized crime, uh, and had been going on for many months. The cannabis trade in America is even bigger business. In California, growers plant their illegal crops deep in the national park forests. The only way to police them is from the air. We have two suspects who are out in the woods somewhere. We're using the California illegal cultivation of marijuana on public lands uh, in California is what I would call in a crisis mode. Every time we go out and look, we find more than we did the time before. Spotters scrutinize the trees, searching for the telltale signs of an illegal marijuana garden a clearing in the forest, and pipes bringing water supplies. In the last two years, they've raided over 700 farms like this in California alone. The top of this ridge line over here, we'll go over the top and that's where we're going 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, okay. He says, look straight down in the trees right down here. See the brown surface? Yeah. Okay, that's the garden. See the dead tree and all the sprouts? Yep, I see it, exactly. See the water rings down below us? Yep, I see it. That's the other garden. Oh, yeah. We don't want to spend a lot of time here. No, though. we want to bug out of here. OK, right track. Right there. Right. Yeah. Shadow, shadow, shadow now. All right, we're out of here. With the plantation mapped from the air, the team must now plan their raid on the ground. It won't be easy. It's a three-hour hike over rugged terrain without being spotted by the armed growers, desperate to protect their crop. There's huge money at stake, making it a risky business for both sides. The American trade in marijuana was very different 20 years ago. Then much of it was smuggled into the country overseas from South America or across the border from Mexico. It was trafficked by people willing to run the risk for huge financial rewards. Smugglers like Todd Steele made a fortune dealing in dope. The profile of uh, people who smoke pot is basically everybody. Doctors smoke pot. Attorneys smoke pot, real estate agents smoke pot, hippies smoke pot, and conservative people who ch go to church every single Sunday smoke pot too. Todd's drug running soon escalated. From buying 10, 15 pounds of pot to sell in high school, I started recognizing that I can buy 100 pounds of pot and 1,000 pounds of pot and a ton of pot and 20 tons of pot. Todd was an experienced sailor and began crewing on yachts doing runs to Colombia. I just sort of worked my way up the ladder until I made all the right contacts. And by the time I was 17 years old, 
I was down in Columbia doing 20-ton loads. For importers like Todd, smuggling was a straightforward gamble of risk against profit. But as border controls tightened, the gangs have turned to growing cannabis without the need to move their illegal crop from one country to another. We've been working this guy for like three months now. He doesn't have a job, he doesn't go anywhere. He drives a black F450 and uh, he also has a white Hummer. Obviously the guy's been identified as a grower. In Florida, the US Drug Enforcement Agency has raided over 750 homes over the last nine months. They have all been cannabis farms, suburban homes converted into greenhouses, known by the police here as grow-ops. The mind-altering part of cannabis, or its psychoactive compound, is called tetrahydrocannabinol, known as THC. And the marijuana grown today has been cultivated to contain the optimum amount. This is not 60s marijuana anymore. We're finding marijuana with a THC content in the 20s, 20 percentile. In the 20 percentile, we're talking back in the 60s and 70s of 3, 4 percent THC. Now we're in the 20s. This is very potent stuff now. In Britain, this powerful strain is known as skunk cannabis. Skunk accounts for over 80 percent of the cannabis seized by British police. Police officers, come down and open the door! Despite concerns about its strength, in 2004, cannabis was downgraded from a Class B to a Class C drug. We had evidence in the late 90s, early in this new century, um, that the use, the strength of cannabis was growing, so that we were into skunk, we were into really heavy stuff that can be hallucinogenic. So we had all of these uh, pointers, all of this evidence, and the World Health Organization said, this is a particularly dangerous substance. And then you got the Home Secretary to say, we will, we will downgrade it. Downgrade it to um, a, a classification where you have slimming tablets. It gave the impression to the public that it was something that wasn't that bad. It, it gave um, a, a, an open door, really, to these people because the penalties were particularly low. Uh, the police weren't focusing on those drugs. They weren't focusing on cannabis. I mean, I felt so strongly about this that, that I resigned from, from my job as drug czar of the government's uh, coordinator of anti-drug activities. In January 2009, it was reclassified placing it back on the police radar. It's uh, basically an office plot of what's been converted into a residential address. There is a large garage at the side which we believe is a commercial cannabis factory. If we get no response, we will force entry. Any questions at this stage? Greater Manchester Police raided 206 farms last year and over the last seven months have uncovered four a week. But for every farm that is closed down, the gangs ensure they have several more. Skunk is so strong, it is claimed to have brought on schizophrenia-like symptoms to some users. So with such huge health risks, what is the attraction of smoking cannabis? 2.6 million people have tried it in the UK, and police estimate that 1.5 million of those smoke skunk. Smoke held in the lungs enters the bloodstream through a network of capillaries. The blood quickly enters the brain, where THC binds to receptors. The first hints of intoxication can be felt within 10 seconds. Most commonly, time slows to the user. Space appears vast. Sexuality, spirituality, and the senses all appear enhanced. Euphoria increases. But use can also lead to anxiousness, paranoia, abnormal heart rhythms, and a general sense of uneasiness. Long-term use has also been linked with memory loss, respiratory problems, depression, and adverse impacts on schoolwork and job performance. One mum discovered that her 18-year-old son had been smoking skunk cannabis for three years. 
nothing prepared her for its effects. To protect her family, she is asked to remain anonymous. A psychotic episode is when um, that they have fixed beliefs that something's happening to them when clearly it isn't. He was throwing things, he was aggressive, he was being nasty to his brothers. He thought people were watching him. Um, and he had a laptop and he thought they could see, see him and things like that. And he was going along the uh, skirting boards looking for wires and looking for the cameras. He, he couldn't sit still, he was just, just stood up all the time, just walking around and there's a camera up there, isn't there? There's a camera up there and, and he, he was just, um, just all over the place and it was really distressing to watch actually because he, he, he just thought they were all over and he was being watched all the time. Because he believed it to be true, he just became more aggressive. And then at one point, I'd, I know it sounds silly, but I actually hid away from him because he was getting so aggressive and so angry. In a desperate attempt to save him, this mum agreed with the doctor that her son needed to be sectioned. I could see that he needed help. Much as I didn't want him to go into, into a mental hospital, I just... He, he, there's no way I could have coped. Any, anybody would have had to let him go. And it was hard, I cried my eyes out, I broke my heart. The psychiatrist said it was most certainly that the cannabis that had brought on the psychosis. So if he'd never smoked cannabis, he'd have probably been okay. Most of the cannabis seized by police in the UK today is homegrown, in farms, sited in private houses. Gloucestershire police are acting on a tip-off. Their target, this unassuming detached house in a quiet cul-de-sac. Behind this respectable exterior is a 200-plant farm crammed into four bedrooms, out of sight of any prying eyes. Like increasing numbers of cannabis farms around the country, this is in a nice neighborhood, attracting little police attention. Today, the growers have fled. Anything up there, Dan? Yeah, mate. But the evidence of their trade is everywhere. All clear, Tim? So what we've clearly got here is um, one of the rooms have been set up. It's already been harvested. Uh, you can tell by the, uh, the tops of the, 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 the plants have been cut off. You've got extensive pipe work, um, which is in the process of either being stripped out, which then feeds into the, uh, the ensuite bathroom here. They've completely covered the, the floorboards, uh, the, the, um, the window there, prevent anyone looking in and also any stop any leakages because they, they water these on a regular basis. Like most cannabis farms, this is a rented house, wrecked inside by the gardeners to create the ideal growing conditions. Here they've left in a hurry, taking the most valuable parts, the flowering heads and the lights used to grow them. Because of the lighting systems, they kind of force the growth a lot quicker than they would do naturally, which is why these flowers are, are very quick growing and that's why cannabis is so readily available, because it's such a quick growing joke. Police intelligence suggests a typical cannabis farm costs £10,000 to set up to nurture 400 plants. Each plant is worth £250, so with four crops a year, the criminal gangs would net nearly £400,000. We tend to find these setups more and more on a regular basis, unfortunately. Um, it, it is quick to set up, it, it is quick to, to provide results for the people growing them, uh, and it is relatively quick to, to get out into the streets. It's fairly clear that at some stage recently that they've um, They've, they've been given a nod or, or something along the lines, or been pre-warned, and done what they've had to do to get out and not get caught here, unfortunately. Hi, boys. Hi, boys. There are some cannabis farms that are exempt from police attention. They are in Canada, where the world's first nationwide medical marijuana law was introduced. That means a select group of people can legally grow and use cannabis for medicinal reasons. Here, 300 plants are grown in water fortified with nutrients. 
a system known as hydroponics. Sam Malachi runs the farm. He became convinced of the benefits of cannabis when a bad car accident left him in chronic pain. A cocktail of prescribed painkillers took a toll on his liver. I never grew marijuana up until six years ago. Never grew it before in my life. Sam's factory is a perfect example of how growers have developed sophisticated techniques to cultivate cannabis and create perfect plants. I like the highest THC content that I can. He wants the strongest cannabis possible. The flowering heads of the female plants are the ultimate goal, containing nearly 18% levels of psychoactive THC. Sam is licensed to grow for himself and two patients. He insists he's manufacturing medicine, not a drug to simply get you high. My objective here is to show people, educate them, as to other alternatives for pain relief, not cures, pain relief. The plan I'm putting into place is to manufacture butter, marijuana butter, which can be put into food products that people can absorb. Then what we do here at, at the farm, once it's steamed and cured, this is what comes out. No leaf, no powder, just straight old butter. And from the butter, we end up making cookies, different types. There's butterscotch, different types of granola bars. The butter can be used just like any other. The difference is the THC content gives it an earthy taste. Chocolate chips in it and marijuana. This is considered a medication now. I don't have pain. If I do, I'll have a cookie. Compare it. Now, what would people sooner want? Would they want the pills? Or would they sooner have a cookie to get the same relief? The US classifies cannabis as presenting the same threat as heroin and cocaine, meaning the harshest drug penalties apply and are regularly enforced. With support from the US government, America's first drug czar targeted the marijuana market, the smugglers, the dealers, and the growers. Today, US law enforcement spends billions of dollars a year to combat it. Over 800,000 Americans were arrested last year because of it. Almost 90% of them for simple possession. Now, cannabis is caught in the middle between federal government and some states that have passed their own medical marijuana laws. Twelve years ago, California became the first U.S. state to legally allow marijuana as medicine. The intention was to offer relief to terminally ill patients, those suffering from advanced stages of HIV-AIDS and cancer. People like Robin Few. The doctor took one look at me, he said, you have lymphoma. Within a couple hours, had me in the hospital, and within a few days, I was doing chemo. So um, I was shocked. You know, I, the, the, I, I never thought of cancer. You know how you don't you don't plan on cancer. Chemotherapy sessions have changed Robin's active lifestyle forever. Hey. Hello, Dr. Abrams. How are you doing? Good to see you. Her oncologist is Don Abrams. Okay. For the past 28 years, he has seen firsthand yeah, how okay. marijuana helps his patients. Deep breath for me. Cannabis is the only drug that decreases nausea and vomiting and also increases appetite. Mouth open. Cool. Also, I think uh, people sleep better and a little bit of euphoria I don't find is a negative thing in people that are facing uh, malignant diagnoses. On Dr. Abrams' recommendation, Robin uses a vaporizer. It heats up the cannabis, releasing a gas, which is gentler than smoke. All right. But the best part is yet to come. It's 
see, there's all this paper in there. Takes a little while, can sit around and smoke on this baggie for a little while. <laughs> I never have nausea. I'm hungry all the time. You know, I, I, I feel like the more cannabis that I smoke, the less of the other, of the narcotics that I take. So that's been really helpful to me. They say I look better than I've looked in two years, and that freaks me out because I'm dying of cancer, you know? <laughs> so. Using dope as medicine is controversial. In California, there are more than 200,000 patients licensed to smoke cannabis by their doctor, and there are nearly 300 outlets dispensing the drug. But under US federal law, it remains illegal. The feds see medicinal use as a halfway house to legalization. How are you doing today? Pretty good, yourself? Good, thanks. I was looking for something that could help me with sleeping. Okay, well you'd want to go with your most indica, and these are our three high grades. Which one would you recommend? Um, I like to go for buds and less stem, so I'd go with that nice one right there. Okay. It takes just $150 and a medical to get a doctor's recommendation to smoke marijuana for medicinal use in California. All right. You're all set. Have Thank a great you. day. The medical use laws aren't straightforward, changing from county to county and even town to town. In Oakland, California local law allows licensed patients to smoke cannabis. One of the town's districts has even got a new nickname, Oaksterdam. Richard Lee is the unofficial mayor of Oaksterdam. A broken back left him in a wheelchair 18 hey, years girl. ago. Hey, how's it going? He uses and advocates medical marijuana. See you later. But also sees it as a valuable business for the city. First won their first softball game this last week. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's our star shortstop, right? We saw this area of Oakland that needed revitalization. Just very run down, a lot of empty storefronts. And so we saw that the cannabis industry, the cannabis businesses, could work in this area and help improve it and bring uh, economy back to the area. Six years ago, $24 million worth of medical marijuana was sold in Oaksterdam. Nearly $3 million of this was paid in sales tax to the city. But under U.S. federal law, the growing, selling and use of marijuana is illegal and federal law surpasses state and local laws. So, despite widespread support here, medical use of marijuana is fraught with risk. DEA does not make the laws. We do not make the laws, we enforce the laws. Javier Pena is a 24-year veteran in the war against drugs. He is in charge of the DEA's San Francisco Field Division. Any form of marijuana selling, growing, possessing, cultivating, whatever you want to do, it is very simple. Under federal law, it is all illegal. Well, they have closed down quite a few clubs, and it has been somewhat of a setback, a counterattack, but I think we're holding strong, and that time, you know, will win out. We don't go after the the terminally ill, the, the person out there that's sick, dying, we, we, we don't go after that. We don't go after the guy who's smoking out in the street corner. We go after the, the organizations that are supplying this illegal uh, narcotics. To help users stay clear of the law and get the best use out of cannabis, Richard has set up his own university. The first classes you will be required to take are politics and legal issues. Wait a second. Hey, are, are you a cop? Hey, 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 what the hell? Stand up. Hey, man. You're under arrest. Is this entrapment? We have lawyers come in and talk about what the laws are and aren't. How you doing, ma'am? Oh, hi. You're high? Profiling is entirely legal, OK? There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. Then we move on to cooking, hash making, uh, Bud tending. Just above those nodes, you cut at a 45 degree angle. We have a can of business to learn how to start a, a dispensary or production facility. 
In the eyes of the federal agencies, Richard's business may be illegal, but some Oakland elected officials and citizens believe Oaksterdam is working. What's up, dude? How you doing? Right. So we pay payroll taxes, health insurance for employees, everything that other businesses do. Head on, man. Head on back. We have a very good relationship with the other merchants. They know that we bring in a lot of business. We create a lot of traffic. So what are you looking for today? Okay. We've got our hashes on the front page. Second page is our medium grade and low grade one star, and our $11 puppy bag. We also have high grades on the back page, 44 for an eighth. Champagne's our best in the house today. Anything else for you? That's it. Okay. Thank Thanks, you, man. Have a good night. Since they've uh, allowed us to be able to have a marijuana card and, and purchase marijuana from a safe environment, it's really helped rather than trying to purchase marijuana out on the streets and where it's really hectic and uh, it's dangerous. I mean, you have to, you're terrified from the, the people after that you purchase it from because you don't really know them off the streets and you have to deal with the situation if you get caught with the police and that kind of thing. So this has made it much more convenient and civilized. Our three high grades being prosecuted or being investigated by federal government is always a concern. I can help who's next. For me, it's worth it to be involved and hopefully be helping um, Oakland patients as much as possible. Papers in there for you? It's worth the risk for me. Since 1996, 11 other American states have passed similar compassionate use laws. This trend has changed the business of marijuana in America. The heartland of cannabis cultivation is upstate California, known as the Emerald Triangle of Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity counties. California grows more cannabis than any other state in America, with a reputation for superior quality. Unbelievably, the drug makes more money than the Californian wine industry. The hippies started growing cannabis in the Emerald Triangle back in the 60s, and it's been here ever since. An illegal supply within America. Deep in the forest, a marijuana farmer has invited us to his plot on the condition we protect his identity. His illegal trade makes him a target for the federal agents. I've been growing weed since 79, that's 30 years. Oh, it's great. It's, it's turned me into a farmer. California has the ideal climate for growing cannabis outdoors. Starting the seeds in February. And then it's a whole process. The hot summer, looking for sun, hoping for sun. And then there's always the steps, the harvesting, the drying, the packaging, the, and the more lucrative side of things, hopefully. It's, you know, it's a great way to have an income. Oh. <laughs> the value of the U.S. marijuana crop has increased sharply over the last 10 years. Some believe it's because of medical marijuana use. Three years ago, an estimated 22 million plants were grown here, a tenfold increase from just 15 years before. These have got to go today. Oh, I'm under pressure. Good weather means the plants are ready for harvest. See all the brown? In a week, they will be ready to be sold on the street. It wants to go, and there's, a, there's ways to tell when it's ready. You can see the crystals. I don't know if you could get it on your camera. We're in a kind of a uh, pressurized situation because of the forthcoming rain. It's estimated that cannabis has overtaken corn as the largest cash crop in America. I never thought it would get to, get to this. It's getting better all the time. If the marijuana laws change again, making this grower's farm legitimate, business in the Emerald Triangle could get even better. In California's Sequoia National Forest, a joint police operation is underway to raid the illegal cannabis farm pinpointed by air surveillance. Almost two million plants were seized on public lands in 2007, more than 250,000 in Sequoia alone. 
One team drops down from the helicopter to meet up with the agents already hiking in. The terrain is rugged and steep. It's a hostile environment, and the officers never know who they may encounter. Could be anywhere from uh, two to four people, depending on how big the site is. You know, we definitely got to be careful with these guys. They're usually armed and dangerous. After 100 meters, the team comes to the clearing. There's no sign of the growers, but it is a newly planted plot. I'm going to say a week to two weeks at the most. Uh, you come back here three months from now, if we hadn't come in like this, these plants would be four or five foot tall, maybe you know, four months from now they'd be six foot tall, uh, butted out. Uh, this place would be trashed. This is one of six okay. plots in this particular cultivation site. They find nearly 4,700 young plants. If they'd reached maturity, these seedlings could have provided over two tons of marijuana. There's two threats to these people, three really. The police is just probably the least of their worries. They're worried about pirates, pot pirates, we call them people stealing their crop, and then critters, the various animals that'll feed on that stuff. Growers operate on a simple mathematical principle. They usually plant five gardens, expecting that two will be seized and animals will eat one. The two that survive will still make them millions in profit. The police don't know for certain who is behind these operations. Uh, the logical assumption is since most of the growers are coming from Mexico that that's where the money's going back to. We do have some intelligence that takes us there, but for the most part, I'd have to say we don't know. The U.S. Forest Service estimates that there are at least 3,000 armed foreign nationals growing marijuana on public lands in California. Was there any firearms in here? Armed and dangerous, these farmers pose a real threat to the public. Hikers are warned to be on the lookout. We're talking about a very systematic, organized criminal activity being conducted throughout the West Coast anyway, on our public lands, by organized crime. These, are, these folks are almost all are armed, and uh, it's very real, very real danger. They, we had five fatalities last year in the state of California, so it's a, an extreme public safety issue. The growers here in Sequoia are brazen, and they are prepared to take the risk whilst there are such lucrative profits to be made. For the drug enforcement agencies, there seems to be no end in sight. The contradictory American laws also make life difficult for the users and enforcers alike. If they're caught, the penalty could vary wildly, from a slap on the wrist to a jail sentence, depending on where they live and the circumstances. But federal law remains steadfast. Cannabis is a Schedule I drug that must be stamped out. Vancouver, in the Canadian state of British Columbia, where cannabis is still illegal, but the laws are more relaxed. The country is a refuge for one of America's most wanted fugitives. This is Mark Emery, also known as the Prince of Pot, campaigning for the legalization of cannabis. We are at war with the DEA. We are at war with the U.S. Department of Justice. This is the largest global marijuana march in the world today with 250 cities. We've got possibly 20,000 people here today. Wanted by the U.S. federal government for selling millions of cannabis seeds over the internet, he fled to Canada. In Vancouver, Emery has created a cannabis lover's paradise. According to the UN, Canada has the highest number of cannabis smokers in the industrialized world, and Vancouver is the center. Emery has built up a four-story emporium that sells everything cannabis-related, except the drug itself. Everything in this store is about cannabis. Every single hat, thingy, wallet, every book about marijuana that's currently available we like to have. We have many people we know who have 15 to 20 different bongs because they're works of art. They're all handmade. This is kind of Mecca. This is where people come to kind of hopefully steal our ideas. We're here. We're high. Get used to it. Emery has funded his global activism by selling marijuana seeds internationally over the internet, reportedly making millions of dollars. We he says he has paid taxes on every penny. 
I have sold millions of seeds. Millions of seeds. And I had a, I had a very good reason for selling those seeds. I wanted to defeat the U.S. government's war on drugs. We did raise a lot of money, and then we gave it all away, including to over a million dollars to people in the United States, as well as millions in Canada and around the world to subsidize a mass movement to try and get marijuana legalized. Upstairs, in his emporium, customers can pay five Canadian dollars to bring their own stash to the cannabis version of a cocktail lounge. Hello again. I cleaned my bong especially for this occasion. So, brought to you. Plus, there's some very killer bud in here. So here we go. Ah, uh, almost. If you, if I were a person who had never had marijuana before, how would you describe the effect of getting high today? So relaxed, relaxed. comfortable. I think if you're straight and unhappy, you should look at the pot people. I think we set a good example for ourselves. But here's the cool thing about pot. How you're perceiving it in your head is changing. So I guess if a straight person would come and go, what the heck is going on here? It's Sunday. And it's like better than any other environment, right? And anybody can come here. And yet people love to do that. They had the hippie cafe, but then the cops came and they said, you can't do this anymore. And it just was over. And so he hit the ground. And you know, my bong was here. I know my memory, you know. Ah, there it is. Downstairs in Emery's Cannabis Empire is Pot TV. A website devoted to marijuana growers, users, and activists. He also has a magazine, Cannabis Culture, that boasts 400,000 readers. Oh, okay, good. Uh, okay, great. So anyway, the glossy that, publication promotes what is close to Emery's heart: perfect cannabis plants and beautiful women. This doesn't seem like a typical day at the office for most of us. Excellent. I'll be here for another 12 hours, and I started around 10 o'clock. I had to see my bail supervisor at 9.30 this morning, so, um, so it'll be a long day. But they're all going to be long days until I get this magazine to the printer. For people like these visitors, I want them to go away thinking, hey, we should do that where we live, and so that they imitate me. Some countries tolerate recreational cannabis use. Most famously in 1976, Holland stopped enforcing bans on the possession and sale of small amounts of the drug. Spain, Italy, Portugal and Belgium then followed, adopting a more lenient approach. In the UK we did too until January 2009, when cannabis was reclassified as a Class B drug. Under US federal law, there is no difference between selling seeds or selling pot. And this is why Emery is one of America's most wanted. The government wants him extradited to face charges, but Canada will not hand him over. If they did, Emery could face years in a federal prison. I do a good one now to do well. Excellent. That thing's too good for one more rock. I'm flattered to be thought of so highly by the U.S. Justice Department that they would use such hyperbole and describe me as a villain. I have returned. The worldview of cannabis remains contentious. I was in a business selling a substance that is the same as alcohol. And I would like personally to be able to live with pride that what I do is not something I should be ashamed of. As long as there's trafficking organizations working out there, marijuana, coke, heroin, meth, we're going to go after them. This is a commodity that's been used by organized crime groups to generate massive amount of money. I wouldn't be surprised at, and I haven't any evidence yet, is that we will be an exporting nation for cannabis. The top and bottom of it is that it was almost certainly um, cannabis that caused his psychosis. This powerful plant divides opinion around the world. One thing is certain, much of the cannabis today bears no resemblance to the weed smoked in the 60s. It is incredible that such innocent looking seeds can sow such controversy.
Visit the medical marijuana capital of the U.S. in American Weed, a brand new series starting next Wednesday at 9. Stay tuned for Air Crash Investigation.